I'll just I'll just talk to the to the audience for now or is that allowed I like to break the rules so <laughs> I'm a rule breaker what time is it exactly okay are they gonna see me okay good Oh, sorry. Don't lose it. Yeah. I just lost the phone. Oh, no. <laughs> it's a horrible experience. You go get a new, yeah. I was without a phone for over 24 hours, and my one of my coworkers was from yesterday. I went to Stonehenge. Cover the head. I had to use a regular alarm clock. I didn't even know if I was doing it right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the, uh, uh, keepers of the wall. way. <clears throat> so this evening, we have three presenters who are going to be doing presentations to talk about the concerns that we have with the current issue of the tar sands tailings ponds, which the Alberta government and the industries want to start dumping into our rivers. And so we're going to learn from them this evening. Just a little bit of quick housekeeping. Um, the bathrooms are somewhere out there. <laughs> So if you need to go help yourself, there's some water and, and refreshments there. The questions, so after each presentation, because the presentations are going to run for about 15 minutes each, and after each presentation, we're going to take one question from the audience and one question from online. However, if you have questions and we don't get to you, then hang on to them because we're opening it up at the end of all of the presentations for more questions. Uh, so the presenters will be sticking around. So with that, I'll hand it over to Brian, who's going to do the land acknowledgement. Hi, everyone. My name is Brian Sawyer. I'm from the Edmonton chapter of the Council of Canadians. And uh, I need to use my notes. So forgive me for looking down sometimes. Um, and but I really want to say welcome from our chapter. Uh, there's 
For those of you online, there's about 50, 40, 50 people in the audience. For those of you uh, in the audience, there's about 200 people, I think, online. And so welcome, everyone. Um, I'm from the Edmonton chapter. And as I say, our organization is de dedicated to protecting Canadian resources for all Canadians now and for the future. Um, so here in Edmonton, we're gathered in Treaty 6 territory, traditional lands of the Cree, Dene, Nakota Sioux, and Salto nations, and the Métis peoples, who I'm proud to say includes my own step-grandfather. The region that's the focus of our meeting tonight, the Athabasca River Basin, is a traditional gathering place for Cree, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Inuit, and many others whose language, histories, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant little piece of Turtle Island. I'm aware that as a settler, I have treaty obligations to live up to, which in part explains why I'm standing right here. Um, two Indigenous values that particularly resonate with me um, about planning for seven generations down the road and uh, for all of our relations. And that would include not just ourselves, but the four-legged, the winged, the swimming, the forests, the wetlands, and our rivers. As we consider the fate of our the fate of our Athabasca River relations, we're honored to have a local elder bless our proceedings. So I invite Janie Edwards to come forward and, and introduce our elder. I'm uh, honored tonight to welcome uh, Elder Betty Latondra to our gathering to offer prayers for the good outcome of this symposium and for the work that still needs to be done to protect the Athabasca River watershed. Betty is a Cree Métis woman who grew up uh, northeast of Lac La Biche and lived uh, traditional ways on the land with her parents. Uh, I learned that Betty is a descendant of the Tapas Chase Band and uh, a direct descendant of uh, Chief Apasteo. Um, I know Betty to be a tireless advocate for children and for families. And um, as a, a grandmother myself, we share uh, although not yet a great grandmother, which I know you are, we share a commitment to protect the land and the water uh, for future generations. So Betty, uh, with gratitude, uh, I would like to offer you a traditional gift of uh, tobacco and um, to thank you sincerely for offering prayers tonight. How the Nascum Tenao A pig with some yak, a pig aki smuyana no scatipskak, Uma Kawis a tuska yak, Nipiga seek a tick, cap mat siguya. Absis in a yawayan, Magaguan maniga near, big squirrel. A kayasim one man got up chitan, can stuta wig, got to a gaga in a yawig. I greeted you all in my language. I said thank you for the invitation and the honor to have me come tonight and do a blessing, a prayer for all that is going to be moving forward in your first symposium. I am a Cree woman. I'm Papa Steo was my grandfather directly. With that, we have lineage to Big Bear. And then from my father's side, we have I have a different lineage. So I identify myself as a Cree woman because I go against 
just being um, labeled as this or that. I go with what is, I grew up with, and that's my Cree way of life, my Cree language. That's where my, my spirit lives. So I thank you for, for allowing me to come once again to do a blessing. And I too, you know, care about what's happening to our environment because our children, those now and those yet to come, we have borrowed so much of our environment from them. And I pray tonight that we will make a difference in all that we can do to preserve Mother Earth for our future generations because we know what has happened and is continuing to happen. But when we have a good voices, strong voices, to make these, to make these uh, conversations very positive, we need to work with those people however they may not know what they're doing to their own grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and so forth. But tonight, as I say my prayer, it's going to be in my language. That means I'm praying, I'm blessing you in my language. And to say to our loving creator, who or wherever that is, I just know that it's something greater than myself that we are put here together. So with that, I won't take too much of your time, but those you can pray in a way that you know how or positive thoughts, however you can do that, please join me because when one gets blessed, we all get blessed. That we learn from each other in a good mind, good heart, and our voices are clear and that we can hear all the beauty around us. I ask this in your name, Creator, that you bless all tonight who walk through this door. Thank you very much, Betty. I had a long script prepared about our, our local chapter of Council of Canadians, but I think I'm just going to wing it. I do want to mention that water has always been a long time, a long term priority for our chapter. We're one of 50 chapters across the country, but we've been around for more than a dozen years, working hard at water issues, uh, working uh, our some of our successes were to save uh, save the coal from the coal mines polluting our waters, uh, stopping the government from shutting down parks that of which are part of waters, an important part of our parks. So our, our small but vibrant uh, chapter is very passionate about saving and preserving the environment. We've done a lot of work and we invite you to join us. Um, there's going to be an opportunity later for to sign up or talk to us about it. But uh, and there's even a donation box for us. Um, but I would like to now uh, hand it over to Jesse to start the proceedings and introduce our first speaker.
Thanks, Brian, and thanks, Betty, for the for the prayer. It's always so nice to hear the language. I've been because I grew up around the language, but I'm one generation removed from it, and uh, you know that's through the genocide and the colonialism and the residential schools. I should be fluent in my language. I get angry about that. But uh, I don't just wallow in my anger and my sorrow. I'm doing something about it because we have that responsibility in our generation to do something about it. So since 2015, I've been uh, going to the Blue Quills University to, to relearn my language. And so it's so beautiful to hear the language because I can hear the words and it's just uh, how much it has fed my spirit and, and helped me. And I encourage other Indigenous people, you know, if you're thinking about it, you know, go to these places that are teaching the language because it's, uh, it, it's uh, our responsibility, but it's also very healing. Um, so Keepers of the Water, I want to spend two minutes talking about our organization. Um, so we are an Indigenous-led organization. We've been around since 2006. We have a website, keepersofthewater.ca. And uh, the, the organization was born out of the need to protect water. And we all have this responsibility to protect water. And at that time, it, you know, because the waters all flow north in the communities um, from the tar sands all the way up north, because they're so connected to the water, we're seeing the changes in the quality of the water and the quantity of the water. The water levels were dropping because in the tar sands they use, it's estimated about six barrels of fresh water for one barrel of bitumen. And so all these changes were being seen. I was seeing the changes in my community in 2006 in Kikano because we're a corridor to the tar sands. And uh, so the, the elders initiated this and got together and uh, with non-Indigenous people and they made this declaration that in summary, the declaration states that water is sacred and that we must work to protect it. And so that's what guides our work up until today. We always go back to how is this protecting the water for us as an organization. So if we're going to get involved in something, you know, coal mining or even renewable energy, for us, we're keeping in mind, how is this protecting the water? And so now we're governed by... Uh, we have a uh, board, uh, board. Uh, Paul was on our board, he's now staff. So we have primarily Indigenous people and we're truly Indigenous led because we have three women that we, we there are Ogamawa Squeo, our boss ladies, and we answer to them and that's Sue Durange, Cleo Reese and Jean Lomcourt. And we have other amazing women on our board like Josie Oje, Diane Giroux, Alice Rigney. They lead us and traditionally in Indigenous cultures, the women were the leaders. So it's so nice to be in an organization that's structured that way. And so that's a little bit about who we are. When it comes to the tailings issue, we are on a strong stand. We are against any dumping of any tailings. I don't care if they're treated. And that's a collective stand uh, against any dumping of tailings into the Athabasca River. So that's, we, we are not compromising on that. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Let's get this show on the road. So um, <clears throat> the... Uh, the, so Paul Belanger, he's our first speaker. So I'll just introduce you quickly. We have his bio here. So Paul is the president of Advanced Conservation Technologies Limited. Paul is an environmentalist, entrepreneur, and designer. His work as a river activist since 1988 includes a science-based Athabasca river water monitoring program with the keepers of the Athabasca and indigenous communities. We've also launched with Paul's help, a uh, water monitoring program with Keepers of the Water now as well. Um, <clears throat> he has worked with Dr. David Suzuki on the poisoning of the Wapiti Wa 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 River near Grand River, Grand Prairie, and on oil field flaring pollution. Paul has studied biology, biochemistry, and ethnobotany. He walks his talk, designing, building, and living in solar straw bale home for 23 years. Um, he's been a blessing to keepers of the water because he talks the Western science as well, like some gentleman was talking <laughs> and a whole other language that Paul understood. So very happy to have you, Paul, and we're looking forward to your presentation. 
Thanks, Jesse. I'm going to make myself comfortable and uh, sit down rather than stand up. So listening to Jesse's comments about uh, being a generation. Be, okay, I have to bring it closer. Okay. Listening to Jesse's comments about being a just generation away from knowing Cree reminded me of my upbringing. I was raised in Gruard, and uh, which meant I was in, in a submersed in a Cree and French environment. And my mother spoke a lot of Cree because she... Uh, lived with associated with a lot of Cree women and um, I didn't pick up very much of it just the uh, a stum queer whole type of phrases that's about it <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> it was a wonderful up upbringing very uh, lots of self-sufficiency gathering and um, uh, lots of wild food <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so what I want to do today is is uh, <clears throat> summarize as simply and quickly as I can the uh, the background behind this 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 whole issue of why we have this massive problem with tailings ponds and and why there's no uh, solution no regulations or solution at hand um, <clears throat> it's it's been a uh, a situation of avoidance of action for a long long time by government and 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 industry um i'm going to read some of my some of my notes and make a comment here um well i think one of the reasons why uh we haven't addressed this issue it's it's far away it's not something that's a, a topic very often in the city the um, tailings ponds are way up there in the fort mcmurray area um and so we don't we don't hear much about it, and we don't uh, we don't smell the ponds down here. Um, in reality, we could have had this symposium twenty years ago, if there was, you know, more awareness then. But what's what's brought, I think, what's made this, what's what's turning into action now is is uh, I think a direct consequence of the industry requesting. Um, their desire to dump effluent into the Athabasca River. So that's triggered quite a bit, quite a bit of discussion. Um, why are they wanting to do this? Well, they're running out of room and, and we have 250 square kilometers now of, of tailings ponds and they're, um, they're, they're filling up rapidly. So, <clears throat> Up until now, very few people really understood the uh, the extent of the problem, and therefore not much attention was was paid to it. Uh, what I remember is some activist action in the late '90s with Toxic Watch, Pemmin Institute, and an environmental group I was with at that time called the Green Foundation, and <clears throat> very little happened out of that uh, that process, and and there was. Overall, very little interest from media as well. So I just wanted to share a quick chronicle of events which led to this issue. And I, th and I think it's important to look at why and how avoidance of action happened. Because in that knowing, there's, um, there's some possible solutions, there's some answers to this, to this problem. So... Industry wants to avoid treating the tailings ponds. There's, uh, they've now grown to a massive level, so the cost is increasing. Uh, potential cost is increasing daily. Um, and to get a and production's increasing, so actually they're, they're they're producing more tailings waste. So for every million uh, barrels of oil of bitumen produced a million cubic meters of tailings waste is produced. So right now they're, the mining operations are producing about 2 million barrels of uh, bitumen per day, which means per day, 2 million cubic meters of tailings waste is produced. Now, I'm not sure how many swimming pools, Olympic sized swimming pools that is, but it, it's a big number and it's hard to relate to for most of us. So this, this problem is actually larger than, um, 
most of us and most people can imagine. So what I learned, uh, I thought it was a five, six year uh, concept, um, the concept of dumping into the river. But what I learned is Syncrude uh, produced a document in 1996 proposing treat and release. Um, there were a lot of, a lot of issues and, and there was no uh, demand by regulations to, to really do anything with the pond. So Syncrude and Suncor and the other mining companies just let the problem sit. Uh, <clears throat> but now, the, you know, they have the Syncrude, Suncor, they, they have no choice. They, they have to come up with the solutions. It's treat or dump. Um, so what they've come up with and what they've shared with us is, is a, a concept where and by the way, uh, Syncrude has been working on a research project for over five years with a, they have a, a pond, a treatment pond pilot project where they've uh, treated water. And, they, and what they've shared with us is that this treated water has, has a high level of salt and about 20 parts per million of um, naphthenic acids, the, the most toxic substance in, uh, in the tailings waste and a few other metals uh, but there's one problem because they're using their petroleum coke, which is uh, a waste product from their upgrader up there. Um, but the petroleum coke is leaching uh, cadmium into the treated water. So they have a cadmium problem and also still a salt problem and, and a um, naphthenic acid, acid problem with what they propose so far. We have no updated information from them as to what their latest attempts are or what their latest numbers are. We're, what I'm quoting is simply what's been provided to us by uh, Syncrude Research. There's no independent research on this. I, we've gotten a lot of questions about what exactly is in the, uh, will be in, in the tailings waste. And we can't really answer that because there's no independent possible research. I mean, uh, Syncrude won't allow an independent researcher to, to go in there and, and uh, look at their numbers or take samples, that's for sure. <clears throat> now, I just wanted to make a quick note about naphthenic acids, and I'm hoping for the protection of, of the Athabasca River and, and for the awareness of the public that naphthenic, I want that to see naphthenic acid be a more commonly known word. It's, like I mentioned, the, the most toxic substance in the tailings waste even at low levels. It's a carcinogen and a, hor a hormone copycat, much like um, pesticides, herbicides, or dioxin. What it has in the center of, of its lar this large molecule is uh, benzene rings and um, other related uh, rings. So th those kinds of compounds are very, very dangerous because they imitate or to, to mammals, they look a lot like testosterone, testosterone and estrogen. Um, <clears throat> now, naphthenic acid is also a prime suspect behind the incidence of rare cancer in the Fort McMurray and um, Fort Chippewa areas. <clears throat> now, going back to the beginning of Osan's mining, um, by the way, that was the era when everybody called them tar sands, including the scientists. Uh, tailings ponds were not planned because in the, uh, in the lab tests in the Edmonton University, they were able to uh, use this hot water process to um, treat properly without uh, any, any need to produce uh, waste. So in the lab, things were quite fine. But in reality, at production scale, they ended up with this slurry of waste. They didn't know what to do with. This was in the 60s. So they said at first, well, okay, we'll figure something out here over this next winter, what to do with this waste. Let's just put it in this holding pond by the river. Well, they didn't, then a year passed, they did nothing. And they kept filling up this pond. And finally, that particular pond did get uh, partially cleaned and, but other ponds were created and 
money just wasn't available to do the research. There wasn't much interest by government or industry to um, overall to spend money on the research. And, but at the same time, uh, an organization called the Austra, formed by the Lahey government, was set in place to do a, a pile of research on improving the process. And so for two decades, <clears throat> um, a, a lot of money, uh, public money and industry money was put into fine tuning the whole extraction process and, and the whole um, operation up there. But the, the, there was a complete neglect of, of uh, in terms of putting any effort towards treating the, these tailings ponds. <clears throat> Uh, but that organization was key, EOSTRA. It stands for uh, Alberta Oil Sands Research Authority. It was a crown corporation. It had independent researchers. It wasn't completely industry driven. It had industry partners. And <clears throat> there were scientists in there who were proposing alternative treatment methods and ways to reduce or eliminate tailings, the, the whole tailings pond issue. Uh, there was also money set aside uh, to even look at treating the tailings ponds, but most of that was taken over by a federal research uh, organization. Now, what happened with all these ideas and all this research, it basically got shelved. I had the opportunity to meet one of those scientists who was proposing some solutions and writing about solutions, Lauren Hepler. And... Um, he was sort of, in a way, his his interests were downplayed, and industry didn't didn't listen very much to people like him. They wanted to focus on ways to enhance the bitumen production and 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 uh, increase the numbers and increase the production numbers. Now, during the Klein era, um, Ralph Klein was known for listening to uh, industry quite closely and what they they wanted. He basically uh, shut down Aostra and turned it over into what we now call Alberta Innovates, which was which is completely, pretty well, completely industry controlled. So all the independent research was was um, basically shelved. All the creative research, as far from what I could see, was shelved. And and the focus then was simply on enhancing the existing technology and improving, increasing production, making the bitumen cleaner, and nothing was being done with the tailings ponds. <clears throat> Stelmac government again tried to introduce a directive to uh, start the ball rolling in, in regard to um, starting to deal with, at least starting to deal with the tailings pond volume and reducing it. Um, industry, industry simply said, um, we're having trouble meeting meeting the, the objectives of the directive we can't do it um so they they, they just filed for two years uh, an annual report saying that they couldn't achieve the, the objectives of the directive still mac was removed from government and uh, the next premier voided the directive and consequently nothing was done the tailings ponds were ignored and this, this was 2014. So here we are, uh, 2022. Uh, the provincial and federal government still have not provided strong regulatory guidelines. And it makes me, makes me think that we've got a, um, at least this aspect of the government the, the regulations match that of a banana republic. In other words, just let the industry do what they want, collect some money in the form of royalties. And uh, during Ralph Klein's era, of course, he uh, he was lobbied steadily by the industry and, and they asked him to reduce royalties, he did. So we lost billions in royalties that of course could have helped us uh, with our healthcare or, or could have helped us with um, treatment monies uh, for the tailings ponds or, and for continued quality research. My, my feeling is, is the creative research really ended 
somewhere around 20 years ago that sure, there have been some pretty amazing bits of, of knowledge developed, but they, they were simply focused on cleaning uh, the bitumen and enhancing their old technology. And I, I like to remind people that um, the Clark Hut water process, which is the extraction method that the uh, industry is using, was patented by the Alberta Research Council and Carl Clark around 1926. So we're soon to hit a century. So what we have is Model T technology for, uh, for this industry. And it clearly needs to uh, uh, modernize its technology. They're, the industry is resistant to this simply because they've invested about $200 billion in their infrastructure. Um, they would have to make some, invest some heavily for about a couple of years to, to change their extraction, extraction method, which of which were no well known, uh, good options were known in the 90s. There's one book, for example, right here, co-written by Lauren Hepler, the scientist that I did meet, that has two chapters out of eight describing those alternative processes, many of which at that time were patented. There, there was a frenzy of patents uh, applied for and granted at that time, that time of very creative research in the 80s and 90s. Um, since then, uh, there haven't been uh, there hasn't been much creativity at all or much interest in, in, uh, in, in improving the technology. And so my uh, colleague here says I have about two minutes. So I think I'll leave it at that and uh, I'll field some questions right now. Come up to the, just come up to the mic here. It's uh, turned on for you. That way the people online can hear your question too. My name is Gerald Savage, and the question I have for you all, the question I have for you, you're speaking about the research that was done in the past, that you enjoy, government organization, shouldn't that mat uh, material should be in the public domain that we have access to it? Yes, it's hard to find, but some of it is online, and uh, of course, uh, for, from what I know, very few people um, refer to that research. But it's very valuable. It was, it was research written in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And uh, uh, you could Google AOSTRA, and uh, you will get some of that some of that information online. And then to get all of it, you have to go to one of the government libraries to um, access some of the documents that were produced at that time. So with searching, we'd find it, right? You will find it, yeah. It's, it's there. It's not talked about. It's not openly advertised, but it's the most valuable, I think it's the most valuable information we have in terms of somebody who's trying to deal with the, the, the whole technical issue and the answers. Well, it, it, there's no point trying to reinvent the wheel if some of it can be utilized or, be, you know, modified or whatever, repurposed, it would uh, definitely be useful. I think, I think the answers are all there. Perfect. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. You bet. And was there any online questions, Richard? Okay, so hopefully the people in the audience can hear me and hopefully the people out there in cyberspace can hear. Uh, there's several questions here, Paul, uh, fairly brief. Um, can we see the title of the Lauren Hepler book? Is that available? Yeah, the, the title is um, a Austria Technical Publication Series Number 14. It's just the title is The Alberta Oil Sands, Industrial Procedures for Extraction and Some Re Recent Fundamental Research. The Alberta it, Oil Sands, Recent. Industrial Procedures for Extraction and Some Recent Fundamental Research. Okay, hopefully... Uh... Whoever asked, asked that has the answer out there. Uh, the second little question, uh, I don't know if these are little, what was the technology that was patented in 1926 again? Oh, that's the Clark-Hudwater process. 
and what and I'll describe it in sort of a, a funny way. It's the use of a old washing machine. You take some hot water, you throw the tar sands in the washing machine with the hot water and put some lye soap in there, mix it, and uh, the froth ri the froth slash bitumen rises to the top. And that's about it. That's all it is. And by the way, Carl Clark used his wife's washing machine for that first test. <laughs> Thanks very much, Paul. It's just the beginning. Yep. Thank you. We're just starting to get into the really interesting information there. And uh, what struck me was your one of the first things you said that this is kind of out of sight, out of mind for a lot of people. So that's why we're here today. Um, I'd like to move on then to our second speaker and to introduce uh, Jillian Chow Fraser. As we prepare, um, Jillian is the Boreal Program Manager at the Northern Alberta Chapter of the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society. She leads their conservation work in the boreal forest, particularly around caribou conservation and Wood Buffalo Natural National Park. She's dedicated to conserving the boreal forest, having spent many field seasons in uh, northern Alberta and falling in love, like many of us, with the landscape and its animals. She has a research background in woodland caribou ecology in Alberta's Rocky Mountains. Through her work with CPAWS, she tackles evidence-based and community solutions to address impacts from human activities, like the oil sands on downstream waters and ecosystems. So welcome, Jillian. I'm just gonna... Thank you. Is this good audio level? You'd like me to stand here? Sure. Is that good? <clears throat> One moment. Well, I can just kind of, I'll say unimportant things while it's not on camera, but I'm, I'm Jillian Chow Fraser. I'm the Boreal Program Manager with the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society or CPAWS at our Northern Alberta chapter uh, based here in Edmonton. And our, our, uh, our work here that I'm going to be presenting on today really focuses on a report that came out that we produced a few months ago on tailings. Um, and also here is a photo of me and my colleague, Matt Munson. We're on Bisto Lake in Northern Alberta, if anyone's familiar with that, in Denetha First Nation traditional territory where we're working on, uh, the Denetha are working on an indigenous protected area in that region and it was a beautiful trip that was a few weeks ago and so I want to remember it as much as possible. So I'll put it on my title page. So just a little bit about CPAWS. We are a nationwide uh, nonprofit organization but we have regional chapters across the country and we've been doing this work since 1963. We've helped lead in the creation of two thirds of Canada's protected areas. So we have a focus on protecting public lands and waters, but that also includes a focus on how our existing <clears throat> protected areas and uh, how our existing protected areas are focusing on ecological integrity and also other things that happen on public lands that impact biodiversity. Uh, specifically at the Northern Alberta chapter, we work to conserve and protect wilderness and healthy ecosystems in Northern Alberta, which is about from uh, about Red Deer and North and some Jasper National Park work uh, we also do. About 60% of Alberta is public land, so there's lots of opportunity and that's also a pretty, air, a pretty large land base for us to be focusing on. But our mandate is to use science-based evidence to collaborate and find conservation solutions on our shared landscape and also support Indigenous-led conservation whenever we can. So what I'll be worth uh, talking to you about today is this report that came out in May uh, 2022 
this is, it was titled 50 years of sprawling tailings. Um, and basically what it does is it's a, a series of maps that shows the extent of tailings and we were using satellite images. And uh, what I'll be talking about today is just some of the key findings that we had from that report, but also just some of the stories and things that stood out to me while we were going through writing this report. Um, really what this was born out of was this recognition that there really was an information gap in what was accessible to the public uh, and what was easily and readily accessible. Uh, industry self-reports on a lot of metrics within the oil sands region, but government and the regulators, they don't often make a lot of that accessible. And if they do, it's often really incomplete or maybe not necessarily the time series that we're looking for there. And so this report kind of acts like a track record for tailings um, since the first oil sands mine. Uh, and you can download the report at this link here, the cpawsnab.org backslash tailings. Um, I really encourage you if you haven't looked at it and this is of interest to you, take a look. It's written in a way that's for the public as a kind of background or, or introduction report to this work. It also weaves uh, traditional knowledge and uh, Western science in each of our sections that focuses on impacts of tailings. We did that with interviews with elders um, that was helped through Keepers of the Water. And so it really, there are some very profound stories from the communities and members that are actually impacted by the oil sounds dance dream as well. So I really wanna start by just talking about how this report came about and it really came about with this aerial image that is on the left of the screen here. And uh, I was sitting in the office with our conservation analyst, Ryan Cheng, who did all of the maps for this report. And we were kind of thinking about the oil sands, specifically about the impacts that those tailings ponds have to migratory birds. So the image here on the right of uh, a migratory bird that has become oiled from landing in a tailings pond. And those have very lethal consequences for birds that land in tailings ponds and come into contact with the bitumen. So basically, uh, if you remember in 2008, there was a mass landing that happened on a syncrude tailings pond that resulted in the death of 1600 ducks. Um, at the time that it happened and it kind of leaked to the news, it, they thought it was maybe about 500 ducks and then they did an actual investigation and it ended up being 1600 ducks that landed and died in the in the tailings pond and we thought about that instance and we thought can we pull up satellite imagery of that exact time when those ducks landed and so this is actually an aerial image of may 2008 so the same month that the ducks would have landed in uh, the tailings pond. So this tailings pond is the one that they landed in. And there's a few things that really stood out. I mean, it is a very impactful image just from the colors of this like dark brooding <laughs> color around these tailings ponds and everything else is this white snowy white landscape. Um, really the size of this really stood out to me. I didn't, you know, it's so hard to grasp how large these tailings ponds really are and also how close it is to the Athabasca River, which is what runs right along the left side of the image here. And also how close they are to natural water bodies. And that's really important for migratory birds or that's a really important risk factor because what happened basically in May, which is when that migration period begins, is that birds that are flying over the oil sands tailings ponds, if something happens and they have to land, the only option are these industrial ponds that are highlighted in red here. So because it's warm process affected water and the salinity, um, ice doesn't really cover the industrial ponds. Uh, and what you can see in the blue are the natural lakes, the natural water bodies in that region that are covered in ice still um, as they naturally do in the winter. And so what happened is when the birds had to land, make an emergency landing, they all had to go into this pond. 
which can be really lethal because um, there are certain ponds that can have bitumen that is still floating on top of the ponds. As you can see in this image here, it's this black sludge that is floating on top of this tailings pond. And so birds that come into contact with that bitumen, if it gets on their feathers, it actually reduces their buoyancy. And so that's, they drown in those waters. They also can ingest the bitumen. And there's been studies that show that there are uh, health impacts from ingesting the bitumen, there's also impacts on the eggs that they lay and the health of those hatchlings. And so this is something that, you know, is a, is a really big issue for uh, these migratory birds, but it was kind of through this process and through it, the, the evidence of the impact of these tailings ponds seemed so obvious to us that afternoon in the office. And the size of these ponds, I think, really reflect the enormity of the risks to them. And so I started poking around and I really wanted to know what other information was there out there on these ponds. Can I look something up to see the actual sizes of all of these? How did we get to where we are right now? When did this, is this pond getting bigger every year? How many birds are landing and dying in these? And there's not a lot of information out there that was really something that you could just Google and download. Um, and I became very focused on this idea of like the size of the ponds, because the more we looked at these images and looked up different years and really focused in on different ponds, the idea that this is even called a tailings pond becomes such a ludicrous term, because there's no way that these features that, you know, some of them are eight kilometers long, could in any way be something that is like a natural water body or a pond. These are enormous, enormous features. And you just come into face that this is industry that is really driving a lot of these narratives. And uh, you know, one of those being calling them tailings ponds. The other being, I think that what they tend to report on a lot are volumes which is something that the volumes become so large that it's hard to really even connect with how much that there is. But size is something a little bit more tangible. And those aren't some things that you can really see, um, you know, not from a historical context, or there tends to be incomplete data when it comes to that. So uh, just an example of, you know, this size and these threats and where they are situated. This is Syncrude's Aurora Settling Basin. Uh, so it's estimated to leak over 39 million liters per year. So again, this number that's like almost unfathomable, hard to understand. Um, but when you look at it on a map and you see this enormous size, and then you see how close it is to the Muskeg River, which is less than a kilometer away, you the, the enormity of the risks really kind of come they were starting to crystallize for me. And I, and I felt that this was an important thing to get into the hands of the public. So basically what we did is we mapped fluid tailings area and then also some of the associated features with tailings uh, since the first oil sands mine. So then we uh, selected images every five years. So it ends up with 10 maps of 1975 to 2020. And the left-hand image here is just, a, um, you know, I've, I've put all of the maps on top of each other so you can really see the tailings ponds grow. And so just to emphasize, this is just the tailings. This doesn't include the actual open pit mines, the roads, everything else there. On the right side is the current snapshot. Well, as current as can be, it's 20, this is a 2020 image. Um, and because we were mapping them, we have the statistics that by 2020, just the fluid um, part of those tailings ponds covered over 120 square kilometers. And then when you add in the things like the beaches, the dams, all of the features that are needed to hold all of that water in, dams that can be, um, you know, like a kilometer high, when you add all of those things in, that number then more than doubles to 300 square kilometers. And so that's what we're looking at today. And you can see the rapid, rapid growth from one oil sands mine to what is now nine operating oil sands mines in uh, this region, that there has been no slowing down. And as Paul really 
detailed a lot of that research, a lot of this recognition internally from those companies that they have a problem here where they can't actually deal with uh, the tailings ponds. And yet we saw no indication of uh, any slowing down in pace of the tailings pond growth. Oh, nice. I, but like also five minutes of questions that I can run into. Yeah, I will indeed. So this is a graph of the tailings pond area. Uh, because we mapped it, we can then make this graph. I really just want to point out here something that emphasizes what Paul was saying. In 2009, new regulations were introduced by the AER to try and curb the volume of tailings. And between that time and when they actually abandoned that directive because no operator was going to meet any of the objectives um, or any of those limits, the fluid tailings area still grew 40% in that five years. So even when there are attempts from this regulator to try and reduce uh, tailings inventory or tailings impact, there was, there was still this significant increase in the footprint there. Um, and another reason that there's really a very poor track record, another reason I, we shouldn't necessarily have faith that this is um, something that's just going to snap of a finger, we'll be able to deal with tailings, um, is that over 45 years, we've seen that rapid growth in tailings uh, area. There is no single tailings pond that has ever been reclaimed. And I really want to emphasize that because it is something that I hear in conversations with people. It comes up online all the time too. And you see when you Google it, you do get uh, results such as this of Suncor, Trumpets, Tailings Pond, Reclamation. And I really want to emphasize that that is not true. It does not have a reclamation certificate. What happened here for Suncor's pond that they're talking about is they actually drained the tailings fluid, put it into several other ponds and then filled in the pit with coarse material and planted grass and trees on top of it. And this, this narrative that, oh, reclamation is perfectly achieved is a falsehood because the actual tailings fluid was never treated or dealt with. It got put somewhere else. Um, and this area does not have a reclamation certificate. They have not applied for that. It's not been provided. So it's just, we really need to be diligent about these narratives that are being pushed, that everything's under control and industry is on top of everything because there's a lot of evidence that they're not. The, we made six recommendations in our report. Um, I won't go through them. I just really encourage you to check out the report. Um, I'll note the first one is to not create any new tailings ponds or approve any new oil sands mines. When you approve a mine, you approve decades of tailings ponds that perpetuate harm the entire time that they're in existence. And the second is to do a comprehensive tailings reclamation plan for the entire industry. And in the final, two, three minutes of my time, I do want to provide some context about why this has risen to international attention and why I actually do think Canada does have its eyes on this situation. And that is through Wood Buffalo National Park, which is downstream of the oil sands and uh, its UNESCO status. Uh, so Wood Buffalo National Park is, is a World Heritage Site. In order to get this status, you have to have outstanding universal values, what they call outstanding universal values. Those values include the Peace Athabasca Delta. It includes its use by migratory birds. It also includes other biodiversity fact thing, uh, features like the relationship between bison and wolves. Um, but since 2016, the Miccosukee Cree First Nation actually petitioned the World Heritage Committee to list Wood Buffalo as a World Heritage Site in danger which would be the first time ever in Canada. There's no other sites that have this. Um, even within US and Canada, there's only one other site. Uh, and this is something that is generally meant for cases where a World Heritage Site is at imminent danger or potential or ascertained dangers. It's for things like uh, hurricanes or floods or uh, earthquake has wiped out an area. But in this case, it's actually all of the upstream development and some of the management issues inside the park. So this is the Peace Athabasca Delta, which 
is, of course, captures the convergence of the Athabasca River and Peace River, and it has significantly deteriorated. The First Nations and Métis communities have watched this happen over decades, in part because of oil sands development. You can just see here how close it is. So these are the oil sands mines on the Athabasca River, and this is Wood Buffalo National Park and the Delta just downstream. The Peace River, of course, also pressures from uh, the hydropower dams and Site C will have a significant impact. So this is uh, something that has been progressing since 2016. Um, it, I want to note that since the initial investigation into the threats to Wood Buffalo and what's causing its degradation, tailings and the oil sands has always come up as a prominent threat that is unaddressed. They felt unaddressed uh, risks to Wood Buffalo. Um, Canada or Parks Canada developed what's called a Wood Buffalo National Park Action Plan. It had 142 actions in it of how they were going to change the trajectory of the park. And several of those addressed tailings and had tailings commitments and had Alberta committed to those. Their goal, what's here in that red font, is that uh, succinctly, it's that the they were going to um, address the risks of tailings ponds to the Peace Athabasca Delta. And they also committed to pursue a systematic tailings risk assessment. So they were going to assess all of these things. They were going to consider tailings reclamation, hydrology, withdrawals, climate change, seepage, and cumulative effects. And this was all going to be addressed by the oil sands monitoring program. Yes, Brian's laughing. <laughs> As you may have guessed, the oil sands monitoring program did not pursue a tailings risk assessment they actually ended up cutting all their funding to these projects uh, in their 2019-2020 budget without any explanation. Um, it ultimately was never funded or initiated. And to this day, provincial governments and the federal government cite existing tailings regulations as achieving the same outcome of a tailings risk assessment because they already assess all of those things when they approve a tailings pond. which. For 45 years, we can see they did not do that. And I think Mandy will speak also more to those failures of uh, the regulations. Um, and I'll, I'll really just quickly provide some current context. A really important meeting happened last summer on this issue. The World Heritage Committee uh, checked in again on what was happening in Wood Buffalo. They uh, saw the action plan and then they've also been talking to indigenous communities really trying to understand have all of the things from the action plan been implemented does the future of this park look any better than it did in 2016 and they found that it didn't so in last summer they made a decision in which they expressed the, the utmost concern that the major overarching threats and risks stemming from areas outside the property have not been met with effective management and responses due to, in part, the continued absence of an adequate risk assessment for tailings ponds upstream and despite new information on major risks. So tailings was a specific thing that UNESCO and the World Heritage Committee uh, frequently bring up as the reason that they believe there are still threats to this park. They again specifically asked for a tailings risk assessment to be completed, which I think shows that they did not agree that existing regulations also still assess for these risks. They include a specific mention that there needs to be a focus on risks to the Peace Athabasca Delta, which I think is a really important thing to consider that these oil sands mines um, approvals don't really consider those downstream impacts in their approval conditions. And they finally note that they do regret that uh, progress has been insufficient in addressing the committee requests. And they do consider that the property likely meets the criteria for inscription on the list of World Heritage in Danger. So basically what happened because they agreed there was this likelihood, the next step in the process is to send something called a reactive monitoring mission, which is basically an investigation, an on the ground investigation of if these threats are still prevalent and if there's uh, solutions to this. I'm in my final slides, I promise. 
Um, so that happened this August. Uh, so just a month ago, the mission met, uh, they were met in Edmonton, Fort Chip and Fort Smith. They met with indigenous communities, with Parks Canada, um, Environment Canada and Government of Alberta. Uh, ENGOs or environmental non-government organizations were able to present to the mission leads. So um, we presented alongside Council Canadians and Keepers of the Water. Um, there are also, Mandy can speak to some of her experience. She also presented to the mission leads and tailings and the, the potential release was a very prevalent uh, issue to the reactive monitoring mission and it came up a lot and the leads had a lot of questions about why this was the leading solution and what evidence there was that it would be safe for the Delta. So I do believe that a tailings risk would, uh, a tailings release would risk with Buffalo's World Heritage Site status. Uh, if we recall, Canada committed to minimizing the risk of tailings to, P to the Peace Athabasca Delta, a cannot fathom a world in which uh, a release doesn't have some kind of in unintended um, downstream impacts on the Delta. Remember, this Delta is already a very, very stressed system. We're already seeing signs of deterioration. And so now is not really the time to be adding a new stressor on top of this. Um, the regulations would be a very strong reason for the World Heritage committee to add Wood Buffalo to the list of world heritage in danger. And that's really important because that's actually, if you get on that list, that in danger list and things still don't improve, then you can lose your world heritage site status. Um, and so this would be, uh, would really significantly impact Canada's reputation on the international stage as right now they really try to seem like the conservation nation and this would be evidence against that. And that's it. Um, I, my, my information's up on the screen there. I really, I know ran up the time, but we look forward to questions. I can, if there are, or we can go to Mandy, I don't mind. Yeah, I, <laughs> a perfect presentation. Um, do feel free to email me any questions or uh, comments and uh, visit our webpage for more of that information and the report. Thank you. Thank you, Jillian, for that excellent presentation. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention, uh, you guys seen that map of all of those tailings ponds, that is open pit mining. What we have learned with keepers of the water through our journey and trying to protect water, because there's three tar sands deposits in Alberta. There is the Fort McMurray tar sands deposit, the Cold Lake, and then the Peace River tar sands deposits. What the companies, a lot of them are doing now is something called SEG D drilling, steam assisted gravity, in situ mining. And so a lot of it has now gone underground. And what we were told by a scientist is that there are tailings in that process, but that those tailings are being put underground. So there's just so much as Jillian used the word fathom to even try and comprehend of what these governments are doing to at any cost to us, our health, the environment, the indigenous uh, communities around these places at any cost to the us for them to get their money. That's what they care about and we're learning that. So it's gonna take all of us to work together to make a change and to stop this from happening. The cumulative impacts, those were 19 ponds, but 
um, you know, there's defore massive deforestation happening, massive amounts of wetlands, and wetlands cannot be reclaimed. People are claiming, like Jillian has stated, where the government is, um, these companies are saying, we have reclaimed the tailings ponds. They're doing the same thing when it comes to wetlands. They're saying that we can we have reclaimed wetlands. Once wetlands are gone, they're gone for good. Um, there is only 30% of wetlands in the world intact. Um, and that, that was done by an Arctic report. We have the link. I can post it on our Facebook page for, for, for those of you who want to have a look at it. Um, so 30% of wetlands intact in the world. And a lot of them are in the boreal forest and in, in northern Alberta and Northwest Territories. You know, we're trying to save because the wetlands are so important. One more thing I want to mention, and then I'll introduce Mandy, is there is a First Nation, Duncan First Nation is actually currently suing the Alberta government because of cumulative impacts, because there's just so much happening. And these companies will come one at a time and they'll say, well, I'm just, you know, one company and I'm just doing a bit of clear cutting and a bit of water. But we're looking at all of the companies and it's like, you guys, if you haven't been to Northern Alberta, both Northwest Alberta, Northeast Alberta, it's overwhelming the amount of clear cutting that's happening, the mining, the, it's just, Alberta has this plan to make it this, um, I don't know what the, it's just devastation the way I view it. So it's alarming. And so let's get, let's get more education out there and, and stop this from happening. You know, we need, to, and that's our third session. So come back to our third session. Cause we're going to be talking about what can we do then? I'm going to introduce Mandy. So thanks again, Jillian. CPAWS is doing great work. Um, so Mandy, how do you say your last name? Olsgaard. Uh, Mandy is a principal at integrated technology, tech, uh, toxicology solutions. Mandy has practiced as an environmental and human health risk assessor in Alberta since 2007, with a focus on understanding the fate and transport of contaminants and potential health risks related to energy development, primarily focusing on the oil sand sector. As a consultant and, a, and the senior environmental toxicologist at the Alberta Energy Regulator, she has supported regulatory hearing, hearings, undertaken air dispersion modeling and environmental impact assessment, including human health and ecological risk assessment components. I should let you do this part. <laughs> Um, studies developed community monitoring and compliance programs and conducted independent research and toxicity studies of soil, air, and water contaminants. Over the past five years, Mandy has undertaken over 200 technical reviews and research studies for Indigenous communities in the Athabasca oil sands and currently supports oil sands related technical working groups, both provincially and federally. So she told me she has left the AER and is now working for the nation. So we welcome you, Mandy, and we look forward to your presentation. Thanks, Jesse. Um, is this good? Oh, uh, yeah, it doesn't bode well when your scientists can't get the year right. So apparently I'm happy here. Um, thank you for the introduction, for having me. I think, uh, I hope uh, this will be a nice follow up to Paul and Jillian's discussions. Um, there'll be some of my colleagues online just cringing. Uh, I get in the weeds. I love details. My slides are busy. Um, I do this because I want you to have the resources later when you leave. I want you to know that um, I dig in. I Because I worked with a regulator, I know what reports exist and how to find them. All reports are publicly available. There's nothing that isn't in this province if it's under an APIA or something approval. So I'm going to go through that regulatory scheme a little bit. Um, I really think I'm kind of like a detective. I feel like some days I'm just trying to dig in and bring this information to the surface because I, I hope one day facts will, you know, move us forward, but uh, not a lot of process in my last 15 years here. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to do a little bit about terminology, just tons of terminology in the sector, in the oil sands. Each operator uses different terms. So I just wanted to land some before the presentation. Uh, then I'll talk about the oil sands tailing management regime in Alberta. 
then impacts and risks currently um, and in the future, and then take some questions. Hopefully, uh, I think I might even have more slides than Jillian. So apologies in advance. Um, so tailings in oil sands process or mine water is a process affected stream that is generated from the processing of oil sands and bitumen. So this has to contact the oil sands and bitumen. Industrial wastewater by comparison is a byproduct that has not come in contact with bitumen. And these are not my definitions. These are the definitions that industry uses and the regulator uses. And this is how they have kind of structured tailings and industrial wastewater management in the oil sands. Then there's clean water, again, not my term. And this is the accumulated natural water that might come onto an oil sand site. So this would be pre pre precipitation. There's natural water bodies on these oil sands mine leases. So they call this clean water. Some of it's diverted to tailings ponds. It's a very complex hydrological scheme that they use on these mines. Um, I don't expect you to get through this list, but I did go through the annual tailings management reports. I review them every year for the past 15 years. These are all of the different terms on the left-hand side that tailings, that oil sands operators would use for solid or semi-solid tailings. So that's the milkshake-like goo at the bottom of the tailings ponds, the mixed fine tailings, the fine tailings, that solids component. Then we have the aqueous tailings component, which is the water that they refer to. And these are very important to me from a toxicology and health risk perspective because the treatment of each of these, and I use the word treatment because industry does, I think remediation is a better word and would align with contaminated sites policy in Alberta. So the remediation of each of these and then the placement in reclamation or the use in reclamation are very different. And so I know it's a bit of a soapbox of mine for anyone who's worked with me, but this is very complex. Not everything is liquid, not everything is solid. Tailings through the Clark hot water process create kind of a very complex physical and chemical mixture that needs to be dealt with in a very um, stringent way. And we're not doing that right now. So oil sands tailings management, there's 28 tailings ponds at eight surface mines. Again, a little bit complex. Several operators run several mines and they use different naming conventions. Canadian Natural took over Shell and they now have the Albion Mines. I won't get into the intricacies of it, but it is important if you're trying to look for reports on the regulatory side. Um, the provincial framework for tailings on the top there is set up. ALSA is the Alberta Land Stewardship Act. That controls LARP, the Lower Athabasca Regional Plan. And under that, the government of Alberta developed the tailings management framework. This is kind of our overarching policy for tailings. The AER, when it was stood up, then took that and developed the regulatory directive for how you will deal with tailings under the provincial policy. And we heard a bit of the history to here today about Directive 78, I believe, and how operators couldn't meet those criteria. And so then we got Directive 85. Directive 85 is used to give out OSCA approvals, Oil Sands Conservation Act approvals. And these OSCA approvals are where we see the first ever objectives or criteria that are used to assess or evaluate tailings for use in reclamation. And I know that's really small up there, but um, I pulled this out of Imperial's decision statement the criteria that they have for reclamation focus on geotechnical stability. Can you dewater it and walk on it? What Jillian was talking about with Pond One from Suncor there, right on the banks of the Athabasca River. They dewatered it and made it trafficable. That met the regulator's requirements. There's no chemical treatment anywhere, no remediation of tailings. The second criteria for subobjective two that they use, subobjective two is to deal with the environmental implications of outcomes, the direct language from Directive 85. The only criteria we use right now in the oil sands is groundwater monitoring. There's not a single criteria for chemical or physical property of tailings that could affect the environment. So they've approved those tailings ponds to seep. 
Those are in the actual EIAs that the regulator approved. They know they would seep, they allowed that. And so they use the APIA monitoring. This is where the complexity comes in. So that kicks in the Environmental Protection and Enhancement Act stream. So then they go to a different approval and all the environmental reporting for groundwater under that approval, the industry operators say, that's how we deal with environmental effects and implications of tailings, just groundwater below tailings ponds. Then there's nothing in between. You move through the AER's process. You use Alberta government's reclamation certification criteria loosely and the AER's specified enactment directive for reclamation. This is all a gray area. So that bottom right hand is a gray area. It's industry's self-evaluation of their tailings and risks. They tell the regulator what they want. The regulator makes a decision. Sometimes they push back, they get more stringent. Sometimes they agree. It is not a well-developed process. So this is the complexity of just the provincial scheme that we're dealing with right now for tailings, not anywhere else on the oil sands mine. And each of these things I've pointed out here have regulatory reports that are submitted by operators annually, weekly, monthly, sometimes to the regulator. It is all publicly available through the AER's information distribution services. You have to email them and you pay a fee and they will access it and they will email it to you. I spend thousands of dollars every year accessing these reports and reading almost every one of them. So if you ever have questions. <laughs> okay, so in that process, uh, I've accessed some reports and I did present this to the reactive monitoring mission. Um, Jillian did a great job discussing, you know, the kind of exposure pathways and risk pathways for birds. And so I actually did get the oil sands bird contact monitoring annual reports. All the operators work together. They come up with this report, they submit it to the regulator. And when I pulled that, I found that over the past five years, there's been 280,000 bird contacts on tailings ponds. So, and then over a thousand birds died over the past five years. I've never seen anyone pull this together. It wasn't easy. Um, the trends are not decreasing. It, when you read these reports, it's very clear that they're like, well, oil set, the tailings ponds are growing. So if you actually do this in mortality per cubic meter of tailings, it's de decreasing, but they have to put their actual counts in there. So when you go to the appendix, you can see, and you can do a trend analysis, which I did, and it's not decreasing. And so birds don't care about how much surface area there is of tailings ponds and how many of them die because of that. They care that they died. So um, we know that tailings ponds are toxic to fish and invertebrates. Fish and invertebrates don't have direct access to tailings ponds right now. They are controlled. They're dammed. You know, they are acutely toxic. Nothing is living in those. But birds and mammals do have access. And uh, there's bioaccumulative and persistent substances in there and metals. And I'm going to apologize in advance, Paul. I really do see metals as our biggest risk from a chronic food web perspective. Naphthenic acids are very important, but there is a very complex mixture here. So I just wanted to say that first of all. Um, and so the health risks to wildlife that contact tailings ponds are not well understood. We do not have a contaminant tissue residue monitoring program in the oil sands monitoring program that tracks very important key cultural species to indigenous communities or key species in food webs. We don't know tissue residue levels for these chemicals. So we know that wildlife come in contact with tailings ponds. We don't know what that looks like when they get out into the greater environment. Uh, I did pull the AER's incident and there's only ever been two and they were both birds, and there's nothing since 2017. I have reviewed the wildlife monitoring reports and can say that I, I would say this is not factual. So the, uh, the AER's own reporting doesn't reflect what they're receiving from industry. I don't know why, but there is a disconnect. Uh, groundwater, I'm not gonna go into this too much, but uh, as we know, the AER approved seepage of tailings ponds to groundwater. This groundwater is deep aquifers below tailings ponds. And I wanna put this in perspective because to me, 
the tailings seepage to deep aquifers are a long-term risk when those migrate to surface water or when we can show connectivity to surface water. But right now it's maybe not the most pressing immediate risk. Um, I'm happy to talk about that with anyone. I don't wanna like ever, you know, contradict someone's research. It's just when I put that in the perspective of all the other risks from tailings ponds, that groundwater seepage is kind of a operational risk right now. I don't think they'll ever remediate it. These are very deep aquifers and they'll be very expensive, but it is a bit farther out. We might have time to work on it and solutions. Um, oh gosh, this is uh, the AER. So this is the tailings management that was, sorry, the annual tailings report that was submitted by an operator to the AER. And it says, this is process affected water reaching groundwater in their own words. Like the, the, there's no question. These tailings ponds are seeping. The issue is, are they reaching surface water? That's when it starts to kind of kick in the Fisheries Act and DFO and contraventions. And that's where that federal research, the CEC report, are really trying to understand how tailing seepage to groundwater is influencing surface water. And we don't have a good handle on that, I think, right now. Um, another piece of interesting information that I came across when I was doing the reactive monitoring mission work is that the oil sands operators actually report to the federal government their releases through the National Pollutant Release Inventory. And so tailings inventories have increased by 56%, which tracks pretty close with your number, Jillian. And so we're not seeing decreases in tailings. Um, there's 49 substances and 68,000 tons for those of you who speak more in those types of numbers. Um, but it confirms that metals are the highest volume chemical group being disposed of into tailings, and it does identify the top 10 substances. This is important to me as a risk assessor, because if you know you have certain chemicals that are being released to tailings ponds in the highest quantity, you probably want to understand if those are also your highest risk co compounds from a toxicity perspective. Are there health risks associated with those? Because if there are, that should be the focus of your treatment. Uh, I am going to flag also, and I'm going to go through this quickly. There are approved releases in the oil sands. So there are 43 approved industrial wastewater releases, 36 of them currently discharge. The NPR, the oil sands operators report these volumes of chemicals to the federal NPRI system as well. This is in tributaries and the main stem of the Athabasca River. I, I brought, these are all the releases there. These are the release limits we use. Only ammonia and phosphorus track with the NPRI reports and the tailings data. They only look at just such few chemicals in the approved releases. And so when you actually pull the industry's report, we see that there's chronic and a chronic toxicity reported from those releases. In the TIE that was associated with that, it was related to arsenic, cadmium, cyanide, sulfide, vanadium, titanium, nickel. I would question if this is not a process affected stream, but we see these metals just keep popping up everywhere. And this is important because when we look at what COSIA and the industry operators are using to focus their treatment technologies, it's oil and gas, naphthenic acids, and ammonia. You don't see metals anywhere in here. Metals and salts are very expensive to remove. You generally need active treatment. And I'll leave that to Paul because I feel like you'll be much more of an expert in that. But it comes down to the economics. And this is really kicked in the provincial oil sands mine water science team and the federal oil sands mine water effluent regulation crown indigenous working group. That's a mouthful. We didn't name it. I sit on both of these groups. Uh, they are markedly different. The provincial group is unilateral, non-consensus based. Um, I haven't seen evidence of current science driving the process. It really, in my view, is to try and validate the water quality based effluent procedures manual, WQ bells. So all those releases I just talked about, those 43 and those exceedances, that's the process the government uses right now. And they just kind of want to prove that out for these tailings, these effluent releases. The federal effluent regulation group, I do think, is looking at it differently. I sit there and I feel that they've expanded the scope to consider Indigenous community concerns. 
how people actually interact with the environment. Um, results are to be determined though, right? It's all very conversational at this point and we don't know where it'll go, but you know, I, uh, the federal process is giving me more hope scientifically. Um, I did actually, so the study that Paul was talking about, I have it because I requested it. So this is the Sing Crude Petroleum Coke effluent that they produce. So when that pet Coke produces that effluent above it, uh, you know, acutely, not very toxic. Out of all the treatments I've seen, likely the best. Um, there's still definitely chronic toxicity associated with it, likely the residual metals. PAHs are almost entirely removed. It's really effective at removing some contaminants. But again, phenols and these fouling and tainting compounds, we see that they're over Alberta guidelines. Those would taint fish tissues. Very important to Indigenous communities and users of that river. Uh, selenium, other bioaccumulative metals, we're also seeing those not being decreased to levels where we might not be consumed about broader food web effects. Oh, my Lord. Okay, I didn't even get into this, but as much as I focused on the effluent releases, my largest concern right now is actually closure. They are going to potentially release that treated tailings effluent for a short period of time during operations. The closure landscape is being put together by various treatment of water and fines from tailings and then put in every place you could ever find on a mine really. So this, what I'm showing here is Imperial's final placement. So this is their actual tailings. After they treat tailings with polyacrylamide or they dewater it, they don't do anything to remove chemicals. They're going to put it in uplands to create forests. Those will transition to wetlands, which also contain tailings, which will then drain to a water-capped tailings pit lake. These tailings will be on the landscape into perpetuity. And that is currently approved in the life of mine closure plans for every operator. The technologies haven't been finalized. The quality of tailings haven't been finalized, but this is what the end landscape looks like. And when that becomes integrated with natural surface water flow and groundwater, we basically have oil sands process affected water moving around that landscape because of poor water and the movement of these chemicals for hundreds of years. This is what concerns me the most. Huge slide, I'm not gonna go through it, but suffice it to say, tailings and pit lakes are the greatest long-term health risk in the oil sands. Placing untreated or treating tailings in the bottom of lakes are a long-term health risk. And here's the data to support it. It's all referenced. I can provide anyone the reports, you know, it, it's organics, it's inorganics. None of the treatment technologies are removing it to a level that cumulatively from that complex mixture, it would not have some associated health effects. I haven't seen it from the data. It might get there, but we're not seeing that data yet. And there are over 30 pit lakes approved right now, like conceptually, right? They're not on the landscape. And the last document we ever saw pull these together was from SEMA in 2012. I don't even know what it looks like now. It takes a lot of resources to go through each of these thousand page reports for each mine site and piece together a closure landscape. And I'm just a toxicologist. So if someone would like to do that, that'd be very helpful. Uh, lastly, I'm just gonna talk about health of the people. Our environmental policy and regulations do not consider public health. We talk about environmental public health. We know humans interact with the environment. We know indigenous people rely on the environment even more than the general public. We just don't see this. I, it, I've been for 15 years saying, just use a drinking water quality guideline. Just look at a fish tissue residue. Just measure the contaminants in that mint. Let's get an idea of what happens. It is protection of aquatic life and don't directly kill fish, really. And so, I will say the LARP, Surface Water Quality Management Framework, does include one guideline from Health Canada's drinking water quality. I, I don't know how someone got it in there, but they did kind of look at drinking water quality guidelines. Um, these chemicals I put up here and a recent study that I've been working on for four years that we're just about to publish shows that of all the contaminants that are measured in the Athabasca River, about half of them were more toxic to humans when you compared them to wildlife or aquatic biota. And it's 
generally driven because of carcinogenicity, endocrine disruption, some of these more subclinical effects that we look for in humans. You can see a slide there. So for any of these contaminants, if you're using a aquatic surface water quality guideline, you would be underestimating risks to humans or missing them. And I think this is important because when I work with communities, a meeting never goes by that I'm told, I don't even need to be told anymore. They're telling someone else, I'm just sitting there with them. But you know, this is our grocery store, this is our medicine cabinet. We have the tools from the human health perspective to be integrating regulations and policy that consider foods and medicines. But you have to look to consumer product guidelines, pharmaceuticals. We regulate these things very stringently. We don't want humans to get sick. We don't want children to get sick. This environment is providing the same services to people and we need to start switching that narrative. I do put up there the increased cancer rates that were identified in Fort Chippewan back in 2014. We haven't seen a lot of recent reporting on this. I went through the report myself. These three types of cancers were identified as greater in the Fort Chippewan population than the general Alberta population. You have to dig into the report. You're not gonna get it from the executive summary, but they were elevated. It's a very small population. Statistics aren't gonna pull it out. So it's difficult, but um, I guess I won't go through too many of my conclusions. I'm sorry about going over time. Um, so in my view, tailings mine water is not a novel complex mixture. It's a complex mixture, but it's not novel. We deal with it at refineries. Naphthenic acids are nothing new. Science and technology are not limiting us, it's economics. And I think this goes to Paul's point. If we could just switch the narrative and maybe we don't all need to be billionaires and trillionaires, <laughs> really. And I, I know that's glib to say, but I, I can't do it with science anymore. Like I, there's no science that's gonna prove it. It's gotta be a switch in society and the narrative. Uh, the, you know, then I kind of go through the different scientific you know, kind of results. The tailings treatment technologies, they don't look at the highest volume chemicals or the most toxic. And that's because the regulator in the province has never forced industry to do that. Uh, human health is not considered. Um, the provincial tailings management is decoupled from reclamation planning. So yes, while we're very concerned about operational releases of treated tailings effluent, I think we need to be looking further into the future and getting proactive now about closure and where tailings are gonna be in the landscape. Um, you know, our current risks, I think we're well up there those. And then there's the future. And again, apologies for going over time. So I did write up a submission to the reactive monitoring mission um, for Miccosukee Cree First Nation. And I have to give a big shout out to Carla Davidson who coordinated all of this and is just a huge valuable resource. Um, she would have freaked out about these slides, but all the references are provided in there. And it's actually a good technical summary of what I've tried to present here. And you know, I kind of end my presentations with this quote from Gus Beth now because I think it goes to the point that we scientists just don't know how to do that unless we have this switch in societal narrative towards protecting people in the environment and away from economics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mandy. Uh, we'll hold. Let's. We'll have. We'll have opportunity for questions in just a few minutes for, for everybody. And uh, you want me to move? Oh. Okay. Um, wow, so thanks for, that's a lot of information. So do I understand we have access to the, your slides? Okay, so there was a lot of information in there and it's accessible to us all, so thank you. Um, so what I've heard tonight um, is that this is a complex problem and it's growing. And uh, maybe it's time for us to claim, reclaim the, the narrative, as, as Mandy just said. And as Jesse said, we, we really need to do this together. We need to work together to be heard. So I wanna get to the part where we're or ask the ask, as it's called. Um, you know, I, I used to be a bureaucrat, and I know that uh, government politi pol politicians react to uh, public letters of uh, around issues. And the general rule of thumb is, one letter of complaint means there's probably ten other voters who are also 
concerned about an issue. So um, we are, if you registered for this event, you will get, and we're gonna put up, oh, there's the QR code. So you can photograph it now, or you'll get it in an email, or you can show it to you afterwards. This QR code leads you to a letter that we've written and composed um, to the Federal Minister of Environment and Climate Change. The letter asks him to reconsider the development, because what I've heard is that industry and government are working to create regulations that are just going to quietly allow the dumping to go ahead of treated effluent. And we don't want that to happen. So somebody's got to raise a ruckus here. And so the letter um, asks the minister to reconsider the development of those regulations. And it asks him to enforce the requirement for proper tailings treatment that was originally agreed to by both industry and our governments, and, but which industry says they now find too expensive. <clears throat> it also asks for a moratorium on further oil sands development until a scientifically validated tailings treatment uh, solution is developed. And so far, there are none. So if we, as I say, if we have your email address, you'll get the QR code or you can photograph it right here. Um, so we'll be heard if we say each send in a letter. If we send it to three friends and ask them to send in the letter, then we'll be big, we'll, it'll be bigger. The impact will be bigger. And if they, you know, if they can send it to three friends, because I think it's really important that uh, we be heard. And if you have your own concerns after this meeting, or if you want to send a letter to our energy minister, Sonia Savage, or our Environment Mr. Minister Whitney Isaac, that would be even better. But I think it's important that we don't just let this slide. Um, before I get into uh, acknowledgments and thank, oh yeah, question period. Jesse, do you wanna say anything more about uh, uh, the next symposium or should we have questions first? Okay. So uh, I just wanna open, Mandy, you didn't get, get uh, opportunity for questions, um, but does anybody from the floor have a question? If you'll come forward to the, mic up here and just ask your question so that people uh, online can hear the question as well. And just state which one of our panelists the question is for. Thanks. Come here, yeah. Go ahead. Thank you, Mandy. And thank you um, all of the presenters today. Um, so my question really is around um, impacts and uh, the health impacts, I think that you've already intimated to us, subclinical and otherwise. <laughs> um, because I, um, I work in, I guess, in, in teaching and, and learning about how we, how our behavior has been impacted when we hear about these things. Um, and obviously knowing that uh, there are people out there that are grieving our um, wetlands. Um, do you have any advice for those people, young and old, and those people um, who are trying to find a way to um, understand what is happening, um, whether or not it is a technical issue related to how tailings ponds need water for millennial? Like, there's just no way for a tailings pond to dry off. Um, they'll always be contaminating um, our air and our water and our lands. So can you give us maybe some way to think about how we can work on um, our efforts to be to be constantly uh, aware of what will happen if we don't do something now? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. It's actually quite timely. Um, you know, in the course of this year, being involved in just so many files and having the trust of so many communities that I work with comes a great responsibility. And in this last year, I've really struggled myself to find that hope and those solutions. Um, we're, we're not, we're, this isn't easy by any means. We in Alberta are on the precipice of like great collapse in the North, right? We're seeing indigenous communities have seen it I think the general public haven't because it hasn't directly affected so many of them. And I'm sorry, I don't have answers. I know the solutions, like really I right now I'm working in the solution space that is retroactive, trauma-informed assessment processes and supporting people to try and engage and move through this because of reconciliation and the way that industry is interpreted it. It's knocking on doors constantly, engaging constantly, 
triggering people consistently. And I'm going to speak mostly from the Indigenous, and I'm sorry, I don't mean any disrespect to anyone, but when when I'm brought in to help support communities technically, we're answering industry has very specific questions they want answers to. How do you use this land and how much of it could you lose before that affects your culture and your values? And that question of itself just doesn't respect the holistic worldview of communities or the members I work with generally. So I think if the general public had that same exposure to these oil sands operators and the asks, we would be seeing more supports and more systems and our educational programming reflecting that, but we don't see that, right? Like we saw new curriculums come out that have actually removed some of these key issues. And I, I laugh, but it's so I don't cry. The amount of times I have gone back to my first year biology textbook in the past five years being like, these are fundamental principles of biology that we just shouldn't be questioning. And we are. And so I'm sorry, it's not hopeful and I don't have a great response. There's probably an educator here who could give you a better response, but I'm very much in a figuring it out, hopeless state myself. Like what I said here, right? I put that slide up because this is something scientists can't do and technical information is not swaying the narrative. And I don't know what will. If I, oh, can you hear me? Um, if I could just hop in really quickly, I, I think that being here tonight and learning more about this issue and engaging with with folks who are also engaging in this issue and then bringing it out into your communities is, is part of how we do that work. And so, again, I just want to pitch uh, what Brian and Jesse have been talking about. This is the first part of a three part series. So this is just discussing the issue, kind of laying it out. So coming out of this feeling a little bit hopeless is is not totally unexpected, which is part of the reason we're encouraging you to uh, to send that letter and, and share that letter and share this information with the folks around you and then come back to the next one. Come back to the next one uh, as as we hear from folks who live on the land uh, in terms of the impacts that they're seeing in terms of uh, having conversations about those regulatory frameworks and, and things like uh, UNDRIP um, and, and how Indigenous communities are approaching this and then come back to the, the third symposium as well. Come back and learn more about how this issue relates to a just transition, how this issue and this cleanup and how we work together as community re relates to um, how we all move forward together. So again, this is definitely a lot of information and, and a lot of it is hard information to hear, but we're going to get there. And part of that is this public education piece. Part of that is bringing our communities into this conversation because we're not having it as a society. So this is this is kind of what we're hoping to start here. So thank you. Thank you very much for that question. And please come back. Okay, was there another one from the audience here? Oh yeah, yeah I'm going to. It was just a lady waiting. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Uh, my question relates to your um, information on the Lower Athabasca Regional Plan. Um, that regional plan is currently undergoing a review process, and so it is open for public engagement. So as a member of the public, I was just wondering, um, what would you recommend we ask the government to include in the Lower Athabasca Regional Plan for public health measures moving forward? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, it It's difficult, but I think it's just to include public health like that broadly, right? I I think there's a lot of very technical things, but if you could approach it and be writing letters and trying to engage with the government, someone who relies on the environment and showing those linkages and not backing down and using your voices, it's a kind of small group. It seems shocking, but it's not a huge group that's banging down doors trying to draw this linkage. So I think bringing in the people aspect and the reliance on the environment and the land and the water and the wildlife. We talk about it often in our circles. I'm actually shocked by how it doesn't come up in all like government leadership tables or industry tables, right? If you don't have that voice there, putting that in there and injecting it, it's it, don't assume it's happening. Um, you know, the LARP regional plan review will be complex. There's many environmental management frameworks as we talked about. So I think just do whatever you can with how you understand it works and what you wanna see. Maybe it's outcome-based. Most communities and people I work with, 
will never care about anything I talk about here, a specific chemical. They care about outcomes. They care about effects. They care about what they see in their family members and in their selves. So really, I think those types of things are important. Okay, Richard, uh, are there some online questions? Uh, there's some statements and some questions, but I'm wondering if we're going to bring in Paul and Jillian right now because we only have 10 well, minutes. Yeah, if all the presenters so can come up. Available. To, so I, I don't know who the questions are always addressed to, but there's one here uh, that anybody could answer, I guess. <laughs> I'm not sure who. Uh, are the metals added during the treatment? I'll wait till I get in there. Are the metals added during the treatment of the oil sands or are they part of the original in situ oil sands or is it a combination of the two are the metals added during the treatment of the oil sands or are they part of the original in situ oil sands or is it a combination of the two so i don't know who wants to answer that i'll quickly answer from my knowledge so oil sands mines and the tailings, they're accumulated from the naturally occurring metals. I haven't seen introduction. The different types or states of metals can be changed by the processing, but generally they're present in the oil sands deposit and then they're accumulated in the tailings. So they're not created, they're not added. Um, and in situ, it's a bit unique. They use a lot of heat and we actually see thermal mobilization of metals into groundwater. So we arsenic is the one that we track quite closely. So again, they're naturally occurring metals and industry has been very effective in creating a narrative that this is natural, it's there, but this is, we are making it more bioavailable. We're making it more available generally just to move about the environment. Um, I'll let Paul maybe follow up if I was right or wrong. You answered very well. Um, just the one startling number is the oil sands ore is 5% metals, which is iron substances, a, a lot of titanium, zircon, rare metals. And of course, they're all liberated by the added salts and whatnot and, and become bioactive, whereas in, naturally, they're not moving, they're not doing anything. So yeah, I think, I think that's it for, for an answer. Got another question? Here's a question for Mandy, Mandy specifically. The AER interface is nearly indecipherable for me. How can I access discrete facts and figures to help me as I make the case to build greater political will in Alberta? I think pointing that out, that it is not usable by the any general public or even scientist, honestly, and it lacks information. So it's very high level. So I think one point that out. Um, and again, just remember, if there's something you're interested in that has tweaked your interest or you're concerned about, you can request any report or information from the AER through their information distribution services. So that page has an email and you email them what you're looking for. It doesn't need to be technical. It can be like, hey, I want to know about tailings and they have to work through that with you and get you those reports. It might be a long process. It's not simple, but so one, I think write to the AER and make them aware that the platform isn't transparent and giving you the information you need. And then two, engage them and try and track down those specific reports. And I'm, I'm happy to, you know, if you want to email me, if you're looking for something, I could give you the names of reports, approval numbers, Unfortunately, at the regulator, everything's linked to an approval number. So if you don't speak the approval number speak, it's very limiting. It's it's just not, it's not, it's deliberately, I think, developed to control access to information. One more question from Josh. Yeah, thank you, everyone who spoke. Really enjoyed it. Um, I guess kind of perspective I'm giving here is, is where my experience is and where I would like to try and help. And I'm experiencing mechatronic sensors and technology, but the way I see it is a lot of technology when trying to come up with solutions for this is very reactive. It's not proactive. Um, and 
I guess for anyone, do you see as reactive technology, whether it be like something that detects a bird and make sure a bird doesn't land or something that detects a leak or something that is detecting so that people can react, is it actually helpful? Just say one thing about proactive technologies. We have the largest ever, like the application for the largest oil sands mine being proposed right now. And they are still relying on these archaic technologies and reliance on tailings ponds. So broadly, we can be proactive in speaking up against those things. The CPAWS report, you could just reference that. Anything Paul has presented here, right? Like there's some technologies we should not be perpetuating and relying on. Um, I'll let Paul maybe answer your question around broader technologies and reactivity versus proactive. So we've, we've got poor access to uh, data from industry and, and government in terms of their monitoring programs. Anything that citizens can do or any other organizations can do that are not industry uh, funded would be useful. And, but that data needs to be shared quickly and, and um, with as much detail and accuracy as possible to the public so the public knows. So it, it, information will, can influence. So absolutely uh, what you're referring to would be very helpful. And I, I don't know, but I can add any <laughs> perspective on the technology, but um, like, I just sometimes worry about this. I think there's just like a lot of narratives that get pushed by industry and a lot of it's fear mongering or it's an idea that technology will save us. And there's been over 50 years of technological advances when it comes to getting the bitumen out of the ground and uh, when it comes to the actual operations and you see very fast technology advances in that way but you aren't seeing them when it comes to the other end and so and then but what you hear though is oh well don't worry don't worry because we're gonna figure it out we're gonna develop the technology and so it's it's not so much this idea that will someday have enough science to be able to do this. Like there needs to be political will and that needs to come from the people and it needs to come from, I think we see a lot of indigenous leadership when it comes to oil sands impacts. And I think it is listening to those communities and amplifying what we're hearing from those communities and raising help raise the alarm bells. And that is what is going to end up pushing um, the the province and the regulator and the federal government and i think we are seeing a lot of that there were some pretty big significant wins i think when there was the reactive monitoring mission um and there was this big public um that really galvanized a lot of attention about the oil sands vote tailings because of that mission and what we got out of that actually were public statements from the federal minister from the provincial minister about the tailings and you know public statements from the minister Gilbo specifically saying that oh if there was release it would be drinking water standards and oh it'd be a process that's not led by industry like that's not something you often see from a federal minister of the environment and so i think it is you know there are there is momentum here and i think it's just really important to be capitalizing on that send the letters get talking and i think a big part of it is just those like counter a lot of those narratives that you hear that they're on top of it we can reclaim all of it and there's no problem keep approving everything like there needs to be a very significant social change that happens there so so it's an, unfortunately it's close to nine o'clock and time to wrap up but uh we're not ending here because there's we'll could be continuing this discussion in in uh in the next in the three weeks at the ne at our next symposium, but for now I'd like to I invite you to join me in thanking our three speakers for showing up tonight. It's it's been very in, informative for me. Um, I'd also like to make note that there's a lot of people put a lot of effort into organizing this event. It, it they don't just happen. So I really want to shout out to. Uh, our, our, our organizing team of Robert Wilde, Richard Mary, Chris Krasuski, Paul Belanger, Jenny Edwards, Josephine Singh, 
Tori Kress, Peter Loney, Rod Olstad, and anybody else I forgot. Um, thank you very much for your efforts. And uh, special thanks to, in fact, Jesse Cardinal, executive directors of Keepers of the Water, who approached us about collaborating on this event. And I thank you for your leadership and for your participation. And I invite you to come up and close the session by telling us what's coming up in three weeks. I don't know about you guys, but I'm ready for bed. <laughs> thank you for staying with us for this, um, uh, you know, through this time. It was, um, we talk about tailings ponds all the time and uh, some we take that for granted and there's so many people who don't even know this is a thing and don't understand how massive it is and how um, critical it is to deal with this right now. What's that big mine? You said it's the biggest mine ever because tech mine was at one time the biggest mine ever and that got the tech mine application, which I talked about last night in the presentation. So the elders of Fort Chip said they do not approve any mines north of the fire bag. The tech mine was going to be the biggest mine um, approved to date in the tar sands. That with a, a collaboration of the indigenous people, the science people and the environmental groups, we worked really hard to get that mine rejected. So what's this one now? expansion so it's suncor base mine expansion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay so we'll we'll uh, make a point to be learning more about that one as well so the next session is october 26th so we hope you'll join us back on October 26th. That's the Indigenous Knowledge, Indigenous Wisdom one. We're going to be bringing in uh, Mike Mercury, who's from Fort Chip. He lives on the land. He's running land-based education. Uh, Cleo Reese, they experienced one of the biggest um, uh, oil spills in their community. Uh, we have Daniel Teselli and Melody Lapine is to still be confirmed. So we're hoping to get her. Um, so I just want to send you all home. Like um, uh, we were talking about hope and, um, <clears throat> you know, so I just what as keepers of the water, we, we say like, um, what can you do? And it starts in your home. And so I ask you all this evening as you go home, you know, when you're getting ready and you're drinking your water or whatever it is to give thanks for that water that you have, you know, because that's what keeps everything alive. And just to take the time to connect with the water and to pray for the water and to pray for the people, the communities in the north, um, and, and that's what I'm sending you home with, you know, is to, to take time to honor yourself and build your own relationship with the water because we all as human beings have that responsibility. And I thank you all for coming. I thank the elder. I thank Wendy, the new hire with Council of Canadians, who's Indigenous, who ensured that we had our elder here and that proper protocol was given. So thank you all and we'll see you soon. And thank you all online for joining and staying with us. Have a good evening. Hi, hi. Kinana, skomt nawao.